Good morning. It is a good morning. It's good for us to be gathered here together at this time, in this place, in the presence of God, where all, all are welcome. As we begin this morning, if you haven't already done so, I invite you to take a moment to fill out that friendship pad along the edge of the pew and pass it down around the bend across the gap that everybody has a chance to, to sign. And as it comes back, you have a chance then to also see who you're sharing the pew with this morning. I'd like to thank everybody for being conscientious about those name tags. They are helpful even this time of year. Uh, if yours is in a safe place or you uh, don't have one and would like one, you can sign the uh, clipboard out at the Welcome Center and we'll get one ordered for you. When it comes, it'll be on the, the name tag board here by the ramp door. Uh, you can go ahead, if you are so equipped, you can switch your hearing aids over to the T-coil system, take advantage of that. If you don't have that capacity and uh, you would like some help pulling the voices out of the background, you can talk to one of the ushers and they can help you get set up with one of the headsets over here. Uh, we want to be sure to give our thanks this morning uh, to Lowell Bunger, who is sharing the, the one altar flower uh, arrangement uh, in celebration of Suzanne's birthday. Uh, so you can give Suzanne a congratulation and a Lowell thank you for that. The other flower arrangement comes to us from the, fam the Durant family um, from Georgia Services. Do we have any other announcements, traditions, or corrections that we need to be aware of this morning? Then I invite you to stand as you're able, that you can greet each other with your signs of Christian love and community. Good morning. I am remembering back to December when I sat in the sanctuary uh, on a afternoon, which I don't often do because I'm here in the morning or I'm here in the evening, it seems like. But I was here for a piano concert by Julie. And as I was absorbing all the wonderful music that she was uh, gifting us with, I found myself looking at the stained glass windows which they're beautiful and they're one of the things that I like to study. But one thing I've always wondered about is like if you call that top motif a flower uh, and the petals, on the outer ring there's kind of a, a brownish uh, color for the stained glass. And I kind of wondered why did the designer pick really kind of a blah color in essence uh, for this. And that particular day though, I was sitting there and I looked over at this window uh, and that brown piece, at least over here on this side, was suddenly glowing with an amber beautiful color. And I think if you look over here, you can kind of see some of it coming through there. Uh, and I then understood why the designer picked that particular color because when the sun came through it transformed it into a beautiful beautiful color and I thought of the metaphor of how often I'm kind of like that piece of a stained glass you know kind of brown and plain and if the uh, if I were a car the check engine light would probably be on at that point <laughs> So, but there are days that I feel like that piece of glass when the sun comes through. And uh, there's a Bible verse from Jeremiah that says, there seemed to be a fire burning in my heart. 
Now, originally, Jeremiah didn't welcome that fire. It was just too much for him. He didn't want it. And we can all react in a very similar fashion. We're afraid the fire will move us out of our comfort zone and right into the insecurity of change. Change is one of those things that is hard for all of us, I think. But we are called to be the light of the world and shine in people's lives. Now, as you reflect on your own heart and compare yourself to others, you may feel lacking. But no two hearts are on fire with God in the exact same way. So if you're searching your heart and you feel you need more fire, stay close to the original flame of love through love through prayer and that desire to be one with God. Draw close to others that you see whose hearts are on fire, because fire can leap from one heart to another heart. And the spark of God lies within each of us. Would you join me in prayer, please? God of passionate life, who sends the spark, who lights the inner blaze and tends the flame, Fill us with your radiance. May the truth that we seek shine through all that we are and all that we do. Amen. Good morning. Please stand for the call to worship. The world cries to us in its distress. How shall we answer? We cannot pass by as though nothing is wrong. How shall we answer? We cannot be so as though there is nothing to us. How shall we answer? Now we'll sing together the hymn number 432 in the blue hymnal, Yesu, Yesu.
be seated. Now join with me in the opening prayer as written in your bulletin or on the screens. God, we want to measure up to your hopes for us. In Christ, you give us a plumb line to measure our lives and our faithfulness. Open our eyes to see the places in our world where our compassion can help. Give us loving hearts that we might reach out to our neighbors when they are in need. Grant us the courage to take risks for the sake of your kingdom. Help us to live lives that are worthy of you. Amen. God sets us free through Jesus and forgives our sins. We live in the light of God's love. Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and it's in your pew Bible in the New Testament on page 67. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spent. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go, and do likewise. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So we just heard a story, we just heard a story from, uh, Kim was reading the story about the Good Samaritan. And in the story of the Good Samaritan, some people are really, really mean to a guy, and, and some other people come by and they say, well, we can't help him because he's not like us. And then the Good Samaritan comes along and he says, I'm going to help that person. And Jesus uses that story to tell us the way we should treat others, right? So I, I want to talk a little bit today about how we know that God is real and how, how we know that God is around us. When you look around this church, look around here, can you see God? No. So how do we know that God is here? It's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? So that's where the bubbles come in. Because you look around this church, can you see the air? We can't see the air, can we? Well, how do you know there's air here? Same kind of thing, right? You know it's all around us, just like we know God is all around us, but how do we know that it's real? Well, I really like bubbles. Do you guys like bubbles? Kind of? Yeah, a little bit. She does. Grandma has bubbles. Do the baby kitties like the bubbles? No? 
So one of the things about when we blow bubbles, and you know, second service is outdoor worship. So bubbles seemed pretty safe for second service. So I know some people don't like bubbles blown inside. Just chill, so we're not gonna blow too many, so all right. So one of the things about blowing bubbles, yeah, now I'm gonna blow these and I want you to watch the bubbles. Don't chase after them this time. We're just gonna look at them and look at them really close, okay? Those are pretty, aren't they? So when we see the bubbles blowing like that, do it one more time because it's fun. It did go on my leg. When you, when you look at a bubble, when you look at a bubble, you know, the air inside the bubble is clear, right? What, what is it you think that you see? When you looked at those bubbles, could you tell what you, how, did, how could you see it? Because the bubble itself is clear and the air inside it is clear. So the outside of the bubble is reflective. It's shiny, so it picks up the light of everything on it, right? And that's how we can see the bubble because it's a reflection. And that's kind of like how we can see that God is with us because we know that God is with us when we see God reflected in other people. When we see other people do kind things, right, when that we take care of one another, when we're nice, that is God being reflected in you. It's like you're a bubble for God. Yeah, how about that? You think that's a good way to think about God and bubbles? I, I kind of like that idea. If you want to blow more bubbles after church, we'll go outside and blow bubbles, okay? All right, so meet me, out, meet me over there if you want to blow bubbles after church. Deal? All right, right now let's say a quick prayer. Thank you, God, for all the ways that your love is reflected in the world. Help us to reflect it for all the people that we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming up. Kim read us a story this morning that we are really, really familiar with, that Good Samaritan. It's one that we listen to like we would a, a beloved melodrama. As each character comes on the stage, we want to find ourselves wanting to, to identify with them, to cheer them on, or even to boo and hiss and reject them. So as you hear the story read, which of the characters do you identify with? Who are you in this particular story? I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud, but just pick the character that you identify with and hold on to that thought for just a moment. As, as Luke begins to, to lay this particular story out, um, he sets the stage by telling us about a man. And from the context, we can only assume that the man is just a good Jewish man and that he, we are told, is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, the audience would have known that that particular road is a very difficult and dangerous one to travel. In a mere 10 miles, it drops 3,000 feet. And the trail and the road itself is not your straight, paved, farm-to-market road that we're used to here in Iowa. It's, it's this path that, that tends to rise and drop and in and out of deep ravines, twisting and turning, providing a multitude of places for folk to hide along the way if they had the wish to take advantage of anyone who traveled it. It was no surprise to the listeners when Jesus said that the man, as he traveled down this road, was assaulted, robbed, beaten, stripped, and beaten so bad that he was left for dead. Wise people just did not travel this particular road alone. So there you have the scene. The scene for the story is all set. And now enters the first character. The crowd would have cheered when they heard who the first character was because it was one of the good guys. It was a priest. A priest who was coming down from Jerusalem back to Jericho. But to our surprise, he doesn't stop to save the day. 
He sees the beaten traveler lying there, but instead of stopping and offering aid, he crosses over to the other side of the road and keeps going. But wait, before you, before you jump to any conclusions, you have to remember this is a man who knows the rules. If the man lying there was dead or in the process of actively dying, and the priest stopped, touched him, got covered with his blood and other, other bodily fluids, that priest would have been ritually unclean and could not fulfill his duties at the temple without going through a whole week-long purification ritual. And while the crowd expected him to be the good guy, they also understood his responsibilities and how important they were. But we have to remember, as Jesus tells the story, this priest was traveling from Jerusalem. He had already fulfilled his duties at the temple, and he was on his way home. So that, that whole concern, that whole excuse, if you will, about ritual purity would not have been strong enough to overrule the rules and the demands for compassion and for aid. But don't fear, because as he leaves the stage, the second character comes on stage. And the good news is, he's a Levite. And while the Levites weren't priests they, in there in the temple, they were descendants of Levi, and they had the responsibility of assisting the priests in all of their duties. He was another good guy. So maybe there is yet hope. There would have been the sighs of relief and cheers of hope would have gone up when they heard that, that the first good guy didn't save the day, but here he comes, the next one, and he certainly would the poor traveler was not going to be lost to his misfortune. But Jesus tells us that the Levite also moves to the other side of the road when he sees the beaten man. Did he too believe him to be dead or actively dying, close enough to dead that aid wouldn't have mattered anyway? Was he worried that perhaps this was all a ruse and it was a trap set to catch him? We don't know what his motive was for what he did any more than we know what the motive was for the priest. What Jesus does tell us is that he does not stop to help. He leaves the stage. Is there no hope for this man lying there? A third character enters the stage, and the crowd's hope for the traveler prepares to rise yet again, but then they see who it is. A Samaritan. The boos and the hisses would have come from the crowd, for this was not a good guy. If this is who's coming next, then certainly there is no hope for this guy lying there, because this new guy onto the stage, this half-breed, this false believer, hasn't got a chance to live up to the standards of either a priest or a Levite. And since they had no reason to stop, <laughs> neither did he. In fact, He's probably going to either run past the guy lying there if he even finds the courage to pass by him in the first place. Plot twist. The Samaritan stops. He not only stops, he breaks into his own supplies in order to be able to care for the traveler's energy, injuries. And then he picks up this, this, this injured man and places him on his, his own donkey and takes him to the inn, and he pays for his care silence in the crowd at this point would have been deafening. Nobody expected this. I had asked you earlier who it was in the story that you identified with. I have to confess that I used to always want to identify with the Samaritan. I mean, he turned out to be the good guy. You may have thought I would have picked the priest since I'm a pastor, but no, it was the Samaritan. The Samaritan was the one that I picked, that I wanted to identify I mean, after all the years I spent serving the communities where I lived uh, through fire and rescue, along with being a pastor, I was used to being ready at a moment's notice to, to switch those roles. When the fire whistle would blow or the fire phone rang or the pager went off, I would find myself running into burning buildings or climbing into road ditches, cutting my way into mangled cars, entering homes, cradling children too sick to cry, doing CPR on friends and on strangers. For years, I even carried a spare jump kit in my car just in case for those times when I would come upon something that we hadn't been called out for 
or, or there was a need for me to respond directly to the scene rather than to the firehouse. The picture of a guy stopping to reach into his personal supplies to unexpectedly care for a severely injured person uh, there in the ditch, that was a familiar image in my mind's eye, and so that's the one I wanted to identify. You know, this story is not about being prepared for emergencies, yours or someone else's. As a challenging as that can be, this story challenges us on even a deeper level. Now, we've been taught to think of the Samaritan as one who was the most faithful, the most Christ-like in this story. Luke's readers could not have readily gone there. To understand the full shock of what it was that they were hearing as they experienced this story, you would need to think first of the person or persons that you find most difficult to trust. And again, I'm not going to ask you to name them, but in your mind's eye, pull up the name, pull up the face, who is it that is hardest for you to actually trust? Envision the ones that you find most difficult to like, to even tolerate, let alone welcome into your life, into your home. Picture them. Think of the person or the group that you would rather die than acknowledge. Think of the group whose members might rather die before they would want to help us, or that you'd rather die before receiving help from them. That's your equivalent to the Good Samaritan. When that Samaritan showed up, he was all of those things to the ones to whom Jesus was speaking. And as shocking as it would have been and still is to have a Samaritan be the one who stops, the shock doesn't end there. You see, that Samaritan didn't stop with just offering aid, bandaging him up, patting him on the shoulder and telling him that there, that should get you by until you can get somewhere you can get more help. He picks him up and puts him on his donkey. The equivalent of you gathering up somebody, one of these others that we labeled a Samaritan, putting them in your car as messed up and as messy as they are and driving them to where they need to be. You see, he took them to the inn. He doesn't just leave them there at the door of the inn or at the emergency room. He walks them in. He makes sure he gets seen to. And then he pays the full bill. If you were to pick someone up off the street who was in dire need, bundled them up into your car in spite of the mess, took him to the hospital, got him in the ER, made sure he got registered and entered, would you also pay the bill? It gets serious at this point. Serious in ways we understand. Luke says that this, this Samaritan pays out of his pocket two days' worth of wages for this unnamed, unknown stranger. Enough, we're told, to cover two months at the end. Well, in our day and age, two days' pay is not going to cover two months at a motel. That would run, at the least expensive motel in Grinnell here, about $5,700. Most of us don't carry that around with us. But even two eight-hour days at minimum wage would be $116 that this guy would have laid out for this stranger that he had never seen before. Still more than what most of us would hand out for a nameless stranger. As shocking as all of this is, the story, this parable, it's more than just about a helpful stranger. It is about the transforming power of God at work in the lives of those who are traveling along life's way as they encounter each other. The response that Jesus made to the lawyer, lawyer's question, you see, wasn't an answer to his question. The lawyer had asked, who's my neighbor? He wanted to know, what are the boundaries? Just how far do I need to go so I know I don't need to go any farther? Instead, Jesus raised a new one. He turned that question to ask instead of who's my neighbor to become the question of to whom can you be a neighbor? The lawyer wanted to know the limits of his compassion. Jesus tells him and tells us, there is none. 
In fact, we are not even just to sit and wait for someone to ask for help. We are not just to wait to respond until we become aware that there's a need out there somewhere for someone. What Jesus teaches us is that we are to actively seek those who are in need and share with them what God has given us to share. You see, God has given us a plumb line to know when we are perfectly aligned with this part of our kingdom living. And that's the example of Christ. The one who loves before waiting for someone to be lovable. The one who granted grace and mercy before somebody recognized even their need of it. He shows us that to love God means that we love neighbor. And to love neighbor is to love God. And that neighbor, that neighbor is all who have need. Known and unknown those who are comfortable for us and those who make us extremely uncomfortable, those we might label as friend and those maybe we would even label as enemy. All of them are children of God. All of them are loved of God. And as followers of Christ, we have been blessed to be bearers of that love into a broken world. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able that we can join together in hymn number 2138, but you're going to be invited to use the words that are on the screen or printed there in your bulletin. seated. As we gather here today, we gather as those who are traveling those roadways of life. Sometimes we are in positions of, of great joy and sometimes in positions of great challenge and need. As we gather here together, we gather for a time of prayer and sharing with this body. Are there requests for prayer, either of joys or of concern? Yes, Karen. Okay, a prayer for the refugees and for those who will be riding on rag rack. Thank you. Are there others? Yes, Dottie.
Okay, I missed the, the first name. Dan. Okay. So Dennis Anderson is he's in the Mayflower Healthcare Center. Thank you, madam. Yes, Dan. Okay, prayers for Kathleen's brother, uh, Denny, uh, who's in cancer treatment. Okay, thanks, Dan. Are there others? Yes, um, but it's, it's okay to lift them up. Uh, for the uh, family of um, Ramona Mitchell, uh, whose brother died this week, thank you for that. Are there others? Kim. So prayers for Tim's friend, not only dealing with addiction, but also from a suicide attempt. Uh, also all of those who are dealing with, with addiction. Thanks, Tim. Are there others? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for your presence in our lives and in this world. And and for all the ways in which you manifest yourself to us. We give our thanks for those who come to us in our times of need, um, that we might receive uh, the nurture that we, that we require to find our way back to health uh, and wholeness. And, and Lord, we also give our thanks for the ways in which you have blessed us to be those same helping, healing hands in the lives of the world around us. We give our thanks for those who have heard that call and, and willingly offer themselves in, in that service uh, we give our thanks for the Stephen Ministry, uh, for, for the Trinity United Methodist Church there in Des Moines, for Women at the Well, for Linda Spransky and the Project Jubilee, for Larry Keese and his missionary work at the Africa University in Zimbabwe, uh, for our Bishop Laurie Holler, our District Superintendent, uh, Reverend Hichan John. Uh, we give our thanks for all of these folks and ask your blessings upon their work and upon their ministries. Lord, we lift up those who are dealing with... Um, with times of, of need and concern in their life, and, and we hold before you uh, Natasha and Cheyenne and Americus. We pray your blessings upon them uh, as they work through the matters that, that face them. And Lord, for those who are dealing with matters of physical health, we lift before you um, their names, their needs, um, their, their medical teams that provide the care. In addition to those that we have listed, uh, Lord, we also pray for, um, uh, for Denny Osborne as he goes through his cancer treatments. Uh, for Dennis Anderson as he continues his recovery at the Mayflower um, Health Care Center. We also lift up Tim's friend as he works with, through his, uh, his recovery with, the, with addiction, but also his suicide attempt. And, and Lord, we also lift up all of those who are dealing with, with the challenges of, of addiction. Lord, for those who are dealing with mental health concerns, we pray for, for them as well as for their health uh, care providers. Um, we give our thanks for for those who have offered to give themselves um, to that particular need in this community for the Mental Health Consortium and other providers, friends, family, and community members. Lord, for those who are going through times of, of, of loss, uh, we pray that um, they might find in their hearts a, a peace and a comfort that comes from, from your love surrounding them as surely as it does um, the, the family members. We pray for the family of George Duran for the family of Joanne Dimmitt, and for Ramona Mitchell and her family at the loss of her brother. Lord, for all of those who are um, dealing with conflict in their lives, whether it be strife within a family, within a community, or, or stress and, and conflict between nations, we pray in every one of those places that uh, your love would manifest itself, your peace would become a reality there. We lift up the refugees, and the immigrants, those who have been displaced, 
As they travel, we pray that they might be granted the safe sanctuaries that they need. And Lord, for all of those whose lives have been touched by violence or, or terrorism, we pray that as they pick up the pieces and strive to put life back together and to move forward, that they are able to do so upon a strong foundation of your love, grace, and mercy. Lord, we lift up those also who are uh, about to venture out on, on the trip uh, across the state on bicycles, uh, with Ragbri, that it be a, a safe week for that venture. We pray for all of these things, Lord, as well as those things we hold upon our hearts. As we pray, as our Son, your Son, our Lord and Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Listen to your children. And now as the ushers wait upon us, we're reminded this is a chance for us to offer not only our gifts, but also ourselves, our very lives, to the work of God's kingdom. Let us pray together. Creating God, thank you for your world of beauty, abundance, and blessing. Use our gifts to bring justice and healing to all people. As we offer our gifts, we also offer our lives in your service, that we may do your will. Amen. You may be seated. Find the prayer of great thanksgiving on either page 13 of the hymnal or on the, on the screens. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always a good thing to give thanks to you, Almighty God, for you are the creator of heaven and earth. You made us to be like you and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love for you failed and we turned our backs on you, you continued to love us. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when kindness and mercy would define our lives and our world. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is the blessing to us all that shows the way we are to live as your children in this world. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water in the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave us to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we now offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Amen. We as many as we are, are one body, for it is from one loaf that we all partake. And when we break the bread, it is a sharing in the body of Christ. And when we give thanks over the cup, it is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we have received these gifts of grace, we pray. We pray that we might be transformed in such a way that we truly do go from this table as your body into this world. Help us, Lord, to to have open eyes that we might see the needs of the people around us. Help us, Lord, to have the courage not to pass by, but to stop and render the gift of your love into their lives. And Lord, help us not to just simply wait until they come to us, but give us also the strength to go to seek them out wherever it is they might be found. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
that you prepare now to leave this space and this time into whatever waits for you beyond these doors. Know that you are going into a world where there are no clearly always good guys or bad guys. What there are are people. What there are are children of God who desperately need to know that God's love includes them. You go from this place with that love wrapped around you. You go from here with your Christ walking with you and before you. You go from here with God's own spirit filling you and sustaining you. You go from here to be that living witness that God's love is the last word. Be that living witness of hope, for you are sent from here in Christ's holy name.